So today's session, we're going to be outlining the most important recent and up upcoming changes to the digital sphere. So just to quickly outline the structure of today's session, uh, we're going to be covering updates to Google's Performance Max, the sunsetting of expanded text ads, the upcoming migration to GA4, uh, including how the platform has been updated, the impact of iOS 14.5, and updates to Meta and LinkedIn. Finally, we're going to be finishing off with a Q&A with TP Zone PPC directors, Rebecca Bant and George Stolton. Uh, so please send in your questions throughout. Okay, firstly, we're going to dive into Performance Max. Um, before we cover any um, updates and best practice, we're just going to see what Performance Max actually is. So Performance Max was first introduced in 2020 during Advertising Week as, why, as a way to buy Google ads across YouTube, Display, Search, Discover, Gmail and Maps from a single campaign. It uses Google's automation to help advertisers reach shoppers as they browse online and in stores. Google has outlined that Performance Max is the best option when you have specific advertising and conversion goals, you want to maximize the performance of your campaigns, you want easier access to all of Google's advertising channels, and you want additional reach and conversion beyond standard search campaigns. Performance Max is key in unlocking new audience segments by using Google's real-time understanding of our user intent, behavior, and context to increase ad relevance. So looking at smart shopping and local campaigns and their transition over to Performance Max. So for advertisers with a website and physical location, Performance Max is aiming to simplify managing your in-store and online presence. So from July through to September, smart shopping and local campaigns are going to be automatically upgraded to Performance Max. Um, but for those wishing, wishing to trans transition immediately, a one-click tool has been available since April. Um, so this tool will give you flexibility to upgrade specific or all of your campaigns at once. Uh, so once these updates have concluded, smart shopping and local campaigns will no longer be standalone and advertisers will not be able to create new ones. So what impact will this have? This update was designed as a response to changes in consumer behaviour and will enable advertisers to stay ahead of trends through Google's machine learning capabilities. We are now see, seeing consumers tap into more channels, offline and online, before making a purchase, making omnichannel behavior the new normal. From February 2022, we have already seen that all previously existing and future smart shopping campaigns will use a shared budget type. In addition to the bidding strategies you had access to with your smart shopping campaigns, such as maximize online conversions and new customer acquisition, you can now choose to maximize conversions with an optional CPA, and optimize for offline only sales. Learnings from existing campaigns will be used in new Performance Max campaigns, enabling you to maintain a consistent performance. These learnings will also coincide with smart shopping insights, including what type of audience, creative, and other drivers impact performance. Once implemented, you will have access to ad in inventory that is already available, plus new inventory and formats. Based on early testing from Google, advertisers who upgrade smart shopping campaigns to Performance Max see an average increase of 12% in conversion value, either at the same or a better ROAS. So what are some of the best recommended best practices? So they recommend to add as many of your own assets as you can. So Google recommends that you add a wide range of creative assets, including text, video, and image. This will allow your ads to serve across a more eligible surfaces and inventory to achieve optimal performance. Um, so they say a minimum of four headlines and five descriptions uh, and five versions uh, of image assets. Um, you should also ensure that newly created performance max campaigns with online sale goals do not contain overlapping products with your existing smart shopping campaigns. Uh, just as this will prevent your newly created campaigns from competing with what you already have running across smart shopping or local. Uh, if you create a performance max campaign with in-store specific goals, you must include creative assets such as headline, call to action, description, and the final URL. We have now seen that Performance Max has had extra support from Data Studio, meaning that your Performance Max campaigns can now be included in your Data Studio dashboards. This will give you an easily accessible and real-time view of associated performance metrics. It is important to note that data for, data for Performance Max campaigns is only available at the campaign level. Queries at an ad group or ad level won't return any data, and crucially, you will not be able to view by placement. So as well as Data Studio, Google has also increased support for Performance Max across the latest version of Google Ads Editor. So Ads Editor 2.0 fully supports Performance Max campaigns, asset groups, and product groups. 
Uh, so you can now create and edit performance maps campaigns directly in platform, making it far easier to find converting to our customers across all of Google's channels. Uh, the inclusion of Google Ads Editor 2.0, uh, or the, rather the inclusion in Google Ads Editor 2.0, uh, is going to be useful for all product groups and asset subsections, as well as the continued benefits of the existing platform. Aside from further support for Performance Max, Google Ads Editor 2.0 has introduced a range of updates. These updates are crucial as they provide advertisers with more of the Google Ads capabilities they may be used to, while helping the tool keep up with some of the recent changes Google has made. These include updated onboarding for new users. So when a new user runs Editor for the first time, a sequence of tips is shown, pointing out important parts of Editor UI with brief explanations. The set of tips covers a variety of Google Ads Editor features, including how to work with images, account manager dialogue, custom rules, advanced search, and more. Custom actions can be used for frequently repeated tasks, such as adjusting bids based on stats and with custom triggers you can automatically run one or more custom actions when a certain event occurs, for example, when a custom rule violation is detected. New combined segments offer an easy way to reach unique audiences that may be interested in your products or services, and you can download and view an asset report for ads of certain types and for certain advertising channels. This new functionality is similar to the asset report in Google Ads UI. On to the sunsetting of the expanded text ad. So for those who weren't aware, back in August last year, Google announced that they would be sunsetting their expanded text ad format in favor of making responsive search ads their sole available ad format. So this is going to come into effect on the 30th of June and will be the only text ad type available going forward. Uh, from then on, you will no longer be able to create or edit any existing ETAs within your Google account. They won't be going away fully, however. They will still continue to serve alongside your RSOs with the option to pause and reactivate when you choose. Most importantly, if you continue to run them, you will still have visibility on their performance. It is also important to note that call ads and dynamic search ads will not be affected. So looking at some of the recommended best practices uh, for when RSAs become the sole ad format. So Google uh, recommends having one RSA per ad group, that you have a smart bidding automation in place, uh, that you utilize all of the headline and description variants, which will just allow Google to fully optimize and order them in optimal combinations just based on what the audience search query is. Um, you should make sure that you have utilized all of your existing static ad data to inform what your RSA copy actually is. Um, and Google reports that advertisers who improve their ad strength from poor to excellent will see 9% more clicks and conversions on average. Uh, they also recommend te uh, to test pinning headlines and descriptions just to optimize visibility. Uh, so this will keep key elements such as the product name, the price, or the unique selling point just visible in the headline and the description. Um, though it is worth keeping in mind uh, that this will prevent Google from fully optimizing towards the best performing headlines and descriptions. Now we're going to be looking at GA4, the sunsetting of the universal analytics, and some various platform updates. So GA4 has seen a new measurement model. Within Universal Analytics, the current measure method of measurement is that based on sessions and page views. GA4, on the other hand, uses an event-based model. So in GA4, your sessions are no longer limited by this time. The duration of a session is based on the time span between the first and last event in the session. The core difference here is that every action taken by a user will be considered as an event giving much greater detail on how a user will engage with your website and will allow businesses to track their data in more specific and meaningful ways. Well, what are the benefits of this change, I hear you ask? So some of the benefits of the change include, but aren't limited to, uh, incre uh, an increase in the insights across touch points. So this will allow you to get a complete view of the customer lifecycle with a measurement model that isn't fragmented by platform or organized into independent sessions. Uh, the data-driven attribution. So GA4 uh, assigns attribution credit to more than just the last clicks. Um, so this will just help you understand how the different marketing activities will collectively influence your conversions. There's more data. So machine learning gener generates predictive insights about user behavior and conversions uh, and creates new audience of users likely to purchase or churn, um, as well as automatically surfacing um, any critical insights. There's more actionable data. So the expanded integrations with other Google products like Google Ads uh, work across GA4's combined web and app data, making it easy to use analytics insights to optimize ad campaigns. 
uh, and it's built for enterprise. So new sub and roll up properties uh, in Analytics 360 allow you to customize the structure of your GA4 properties to meet data governance needs. So there are some actionable changes for us advertisers. Due to the attribution model and the way <coughs> events are tracked, you will not be able to import current universal analytics data into the new GA4 profiles. Setting up GA4 prior to June will mean that year-on-year -year data will be, will be able to be viewed, giving you a seamless transition. So just for those of you who have already made the switch to GA4, uh, there are multiple updates that we've seen since the turn of the new year. We're not going to have time to cover all of these individually uh, in super amounts of depth, um, so we're just going to cover the key highlights. Uh, so on January 7th, um, saw the cross-channel data-driven attribution model, or the DDA, uh, become available within attribution reports. So users with, edit, uh, with the editor role on their property uh, are now able to select an attribution model and look back window at the property level to apply to a number of reports. Uh, on the 11th of February, we saw the GA4's integration with Display and Video 360 uh, meant that users were able to see uh, were able to see attributed display and video 360 traffic appear in their GA4 cross-channel reporting. Uh, for those eligible for GA4, uh, so eligible GA4 audiences uh, were also exported to display and video 360 for use in campaign targeting. On the 4th of March, GA4 introduced a new homepage which services information relevant to you based on your behaviour and analytics. March 14th saw GA4's integration with Search Ads 360. So this gained users access to dedicated Search Ads 360 reporting and have seen attributed Search Ads 360 traffic appear in their GA4 cross-channel reporting. GA4 conversions were exported to Search Ads 360 and are, and are available in Search Ads 360 reporting. March 18th saw Android SDK changes for advertising ID permissions. So apps that update their target API to 31 on Android 12 will need to declare a Google Play services normal, normal permission in the Android manifest to use the advertising ID. For apps that did not declare this permission and target Android 12, the advertising ID was automatically removed and replaced with a string of zeros. Uh, April 16th saw the introduction of auto-suggestion auto for search. So the search box at the top of analytics now provides suggestions to help you find information. April 22nd saw changes to the tagging sessions in, property, in the property change history. And on May 20th, uh, we saw conversion modeling for the consent, uh, for consent app mode and app conversions. So GA4 is introducing, or, or rather has just introduced, uh, new types of conversion modeling for users implementing consent mode and for app users with Apple's app tra tracking and transparency. So modeling will help fill the gaps where the observed data uh, is unavailable. We're now going to be looking at what's changed across iOS 14. The iOS 14 update has caused major ripples amongst marketers due to Apple's new stance on app tracking. The update means that Apple users need to opt into tracking rather than opt out. On iOS 14.5 devices, Apple's policy prohibits certain data collection and sharing unless people opt into tracking on iOS 14.5 or later devices via the prompt. As a result, ad personalization and performance reporting has become limited for both app and web conversion events for many. So just looking at the impact, um, so any campaigns that you've set up that track a pixel event uh, are now likely to be underreported uh, just due to users choosing to opt out. Um, so as more people opt out of the tracking on their Apple devices, the size of your app connections, uh, app activity custom audiences and website custom audiences are very likely to have decreased. Uh, so as a consequence of this, this has obviously impacted the ability to remarket. So what was once one of the stronger means of converting um, has had its volume significantly reduced. Uh, and as a consequence, the reliance on prospecting audiences um, has increased. Uh, and so last but not least, we're just going to be looking at some of the updates to Meta and LinkedIn platforms. So just looking at Meta and Facebook. Back in October, Facebook announced it was rebranding as Meta. The rebrand itself had no real impact for us advertisers, but in the interests of its new direction, it has since announced changes to its targeting. So the changes to Facebook targeting have been rolled out for approximately four months now, uh, with Facebook removing targeting options towards certain groups. So this included health, which included awareness, prevention and treatment topics, religious beliefs, sexual orientations, political affiliations uh, and your race uh, and ethnicity. 
Um, if you didn't change your targeting yourself before March 2022, Facebook uh, Ads Manager would modify them automatically. Um, if you included one of these removed topics, then Facebook Ads Manager will have removed it and updated your delivery accordingly. Uh, and then so finally, if you excluded one of these topics, uh, Ads Manager will have paused all affected ad sets, which means that you will need to update and republish them manually, uh, ensuring that they meet all the new requirements. Before our Q&A, I'm going to finish with some of the updates that we've seen across LinkedIn. So LinkedIn is updating the campaign manager navigation experience to help us advertisers become more efficient with our time. They boast a more organized and simplified experience, which will allow advertisers to more easily navigate the platform. So just looking at what is new and upcoming in 2022 for LinkedIn, um, as some of you with a keen eye may have noticed, a lot of these are organic updates uh, so that we're seeing across the platform. But as we often see where organic follow up begins, a paid often really isn't far behind. So as it stands, LinkedIn Stories, these are exclusively available for premium users. So LinkedIn Stories will allow you to add photos, videos, which will give you a 10 second clip where you're allowed to add uh, text, filters, music, et cetera. Um, very, very similar to what we see across LinkedIn. Um, and so once they're uploaded, this will be available for about 24 hours. And if what we've seen on Facebook and Instagram is true, it's very likely paid will follow uh, in this stead. Uh, so LinkedIn live videos, these will allow you to communicate with the communities and audiences just in real time. Um, just the catch here being that you do have to apply to be able to do this just to make sure that you meet certain criteria. Uh, there are LinkedIn polls, so these are a great way to gather marketing insights and just help increasing uh, engagement with your audience. So you're able to create a poll for between two to four options and then track the percentages just as your, as your audience votes. So you'll be able to mess edit messages after sending. There's no news yet on whether this will apply to your in-mail marketing, but fingers crossed. The highlight features allows you to share your own articles or blogs or the favorites that you've shared. And event tabs are said to make it even more simple to create a LinkedIn event. Um, so if you've ended up, <coughs> pardon me, uh, if you've ended up with multiple accounts, uh, LinkedIn has now made it much simpler to merge them into one uh, and transfer over all your connections. Uh, and then for influencers who create their own content, LinkedIn announced, LinkedIn announced creator mode in 2021, uh, and it allows you to share the topics uh, that you talk about with your community and makes it easier for you to find and follow your posts, helping you grow and reach your uh, and reach and influence. Uh, so the creator mode feature has been launched very gradually. So it's possible that you uh, haven't got access to it just yet. So if you don't, just be patient. It won't take too much longer. So thank you for joining our back to school industry updates across the paid media landscape. We're now going to be joined by our PPC directors, George Stolton and Rebecca Bampton for our Q&A. Hello, Hi guys, thanks for the webinar. Um, I guess, yeah, let's jump in straight away with the questions. Good. It looks like we've got one in from Shannon who would like to know, I guess I'll give this to your, you, George, mm -hmm. is performance max available for all bidding strategies? Yeah, so at the moment it is conversion focused, so whether that's online sales, lead gen or offline sales. In terms of bid strategies, you can only use maximised conversions or maximise conversion value. I would expect something like target ROAS not to be very far behind but I think the way it's set up it's probably not going to happen for share of voice sort of campaigns like impression share or anything like that um, it's, it's very much conversion focused at the moment cool in terms of how they have performed so far it's a bit of a mixed bag they're very black box uh, campaign type is not much in terms of reporting to understand where you're at showing uh, or what's actually performing well. From an e-commerce perspective, they are effective, but it does cannibalize shopping ads. So it's not clear yet if they're significantly more effective than just running shopping ads, um, but you do get the sort of incremental reach and other activity with the search and YouTube and, and display placements as well. It, it kind of remains to be seen um, just how effective they are. Obviously, Google are very good and they're going to be the future, but um, 
I think they're worth testing for each scenario. Worth mentioning again is what Patrick and Alex mentioned in their presentation as well is Google recommends there is a longer learning phase uh, for these campaign types. So it is four to six weeks, whereas generally, I think we generally just kind of look at it between the two to four week variables for these as well. So you do need to give performance max a bit more time as well. Um, I expect over time we might see some similarities between these and Google app campaigns, just because they've moved over them before to actually show just across like search display placements, whereas before you could actually manually choose where you would appear. And you should start to see that some text assets or images start to perform a lot better over time. But I would again, just recommend to always wait that four or six week period initially before you start looking at performance. Lovely. Um, so James has asked, how do we gain learnings from RSA ads if metrics beyond impressions are not available for headlines and descriptions currently? Um, generally for these, you do Google do give a performance column, so it ranks them kind of below good or best. What's recommended is to follow this is because it looks at that all time. So recommended if you do start seeing over a few weeks or actually a few months, depending on your campaign spend, some low performing text assets, you should start removing them in the RSAs and actually start focusing on maybe making different variations of your best um, headlines or descriptions or putting in a few more variations. So it's always kind of just manually updating them. It is unfortunate, it is a bit of a big black box with some of the other things we're seeing across Google at the moment, where, as you mentioned, it is beyond impressions. We can't see clicks, conversions towards each headline or description anymore either. Just to add to that, you can still run multiple different RSAs in an ad group. So you can quite easily change the text between them, label them up and compare performance that way. If you want to look at more conversion metrics, um, you obviously just need enough data. Um, I think you need 5,000 impressions over 30 days to get enough data for Google to rank it as poor or good or excellent. Um, so it does take a bit of time considering the number of possible variations as well. Yeah, um, with RSAs as well, even though there is a maximum of like 15 headlines and four descriptions for each one, you don't have to use them all in one RSA. So if you do have certain types of themes within your campaigns or ad groups, it's probably worth splitting them up so you have like five headlines throughout, throughout three different RSA ads, as long as they're kind of grouped from themes, because then you can get more digestible learnings of what's working well in terms of click-through rate, but also in a later metric, perhaps a uh, conversion rate as well. We've got another one asking the many updates on LinkedIn organically. What do we expect to happen paid in the future? From the list that was shown, I probably put my money on stories at some point, just because of the success of Instagram stories and other vertical platforms like TikTok and, and Snapchat. There are obviously very different audiences between them, but vertical videos, especially with you know how prominent mobile is, kind of just makes sense across most platforms. One of the newer features, um, which is still rolling out, which is really powerful, is remarketing based on ad clicks of images. Previously, you could only remarket based on video views, which is obviously quite limited. Um, if you don't have video content, you can now do it on images, which is more likely what you're gonna be running. And then we have a, another question, which is what can we do to optimize iOS audiences with less data available? Um, so probably the number one recommendation actually is for Google as well, is if you do have limited spend, is don't make multiple campaigns to begin with. Um, just because these ones, they do need enough data pumping through. And if people are opted out of tracking as well, there's gonna be less insights and less data going in towards the Google Ads platform. So number one recommendation is actually to condense some campaigns if you don't have enough spend, especially if you are actually only optimizing towards one app level event as well. Um, it's recommended to always start with some upper funnel events. So don't go straight down. So example, if you have an app that is an e-commerce and one of the lower fun funnel events is purchases, 
it's never recommended as well to start optimizing towards purchases as well. You need those upper funnel level data, and over time that will actually start fueling the lower funnel data. So if over like a month you're starting to see like 100 purchases or more starting to come through the app, that's maybe when you can look at sort of relaunching the campaign, optimizing towards some of those lower funnel, blend, uh, funnel events as well. Yeah, that's all the questions so far. Let us know if you have any others. Oh, one more has popped through. So from Scarlett, with Facebook audiences becoming restricted, um, how do you reckon this will start affecting overall campaign performance? Yeah, I can touch on that. So that's mostly in relation to the actual interest audiences within Facebook. So it's always going to be higher funnel prospecting type activity. Um, for the most part, I think they're just tidying it up, merging it, and getting rid of anything um, that's a bit more controversial. So based on that, I don't think there'll be any significant changes in, in actual performance, considering it's less likely to be users that are going to take direct action straight away anyway. It's probably going to be more traffic driving and, and everything else like that. I would still prioritize your first party data and lookalikes and things like that as much as possible. Um, if you have that, that data to hand, because it's just going to be more valuable than whatever interests are available anyway. Yeah, I would say as well, even though not all of those niche audiences are available now, they are still blended in, in larger audiences as well. Especially, it's very similar with what we've seen across Google, is Facebook will start optimizing towards the best campaigns and best groups. So if you combine them in the ad set, you'll just naturally start optimizing towards those groups that are doing well anyway. So it's not like because they've removed those audiences, that's not available anymore, those individuals on Facebook. Uh, going back to performance max, what if you don't have a resource to create assets for performance max campaigns? So you can run images and videos. Videos are obviously going to be a bit harder if you don't have the content, but you can just not run across those placements. For images, if you don't have anything produced, Google can scrape images from your website and automatically pull them in. You can also look at your Instagram profiles. It can sometimes pick that up automatically. So if you've got good content there, it can pull that in as well. And if it really comes to it, there are stock images which you can use um, as well, which combine with your own customized ad text, headlines and descriptions, et cetera, probably would still fit and still work. Um, it just wouldn't have your branding or anything else outside of your sort of logo and company name on the text. Yeah, this is one to good to mention actually for other campaign types as well, because this is a very similar feature for the Google app campaigns. If there are no assets or videos available, it doesn't mean Google won't show these. They will just scrape your Google Play Store or your website if you put that in as well. So it's just one to be aware of. If just because you haven't maybe put an image or a video in, doesn't mean they won't show an image or video based on what you've kind of got on your website or Instagram, as George mentioned as well. So Scarlett has mentioned, does Performance Max show placement performance? Um, unfortunately not, it is a bit of a black box here. We cannot see um, whether it's, we've seen certain amount of impressions or performance come through search or display or um, YouTube. What I would say is one to take a pinch of salt of this one is you can at least see what text assets are performing well, what uh, static assets are performing well. So generally when over time you might see that impressions show highly towards text assets um, and that can kind of you can indicate that it's probably appearing a lot more on Google search ads, but you can't say like definitely they all are. Cool. I think that's the last question. Um, so I guess we can start wrapping up the webinar. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, no more questions come through and I believe that's time as well. Um, so thank you all very much for joining. Um, I hope that it was informative and hopefully see you at the next one.